Hello. In this lecture, we will uh, learn about several concepts, I mean, including virtual displacement, virtual work, and the principle of virtual work, and also D'Alembert's principle. So, all these concepts, we will start with, uh, of course, the virtual displacement. A virtual displacement typically refers to an imaginary displacement of a particle and this imaginary displacement must be commensurate with the given constraint relation, which means that this displacement is not actually taking place in real time, but it's basically uh, we move the particle we imagine that we are moving the particle, it does not involve real time and this movement must obey the constraint relation. We, we start with an example, let us suppose, I mean, we have a plane and we have a particle which is moving on this plane it's not leaving the plane. So, the constraint relation means that the a particle, say, is confined to this plane, given by this equation. Now, let us suppose that at r, I mean the particle was at r at time t and then it has moved to r plus dr at time t plus dt. Now, so particle was here and now after a time dt it is there. So, this displacement that you can see, it's a real displacement. It involves two different instances of time and particle actually in reality gets displaced from first position to the second position and this is what we call a real displacement. On the other hand, uh, take this point 1, the first point at r at time t and suppose at this particular time we imagine that we are moving the particle this way or this way or uh, along this line. In all this motion remember we are not leaving the plane we are on the plane and we are satisfying the constraint relation all the time. If we do that then such displacements, we represent them by delta r, we call them virtual displacement. So, uh, just to repeat, the virtual displacements does not happen in real time, it's like freezing the motion and making an imagination, we are imagining that the, we are moving the particle. It does not have to be along the uh, direction along which the particle was moving. It could be any direction as long as we satisfy the constraint, it is virtual displacement. So, I mean, uh, let's look at some examples to better understand what we mean by virtual displacement. This example, that particle moving on a plane, it's, it's already a good example that virtual displacement could be along any direction other than the path the particle actually following. Now let us suppose the, another case where uh, a, a particle is uh, moving on a circle. So here too we can have the particle at say position r at time t and at a later time r plus dr at time t plus dt. So, uh, this displacement is a real displacement. But virtual displacement, I mean again from a particular given point could be along this direction or along this direction, it could be along the real uh, displacement or could be along the opposite direction. It does not have to be along the real displacement but it must be on the circle, okay. So, uh, that is a virtual displacement if you consider a particle 
along moving along a line i mean same thing can happen if the particle is falling down a slope so um let's say this angle is alpha the height of the block is h this is our origin and the particle is given by x and y if that happens so then we have already seen the constraint relation is given by x ten alpha plus y minus h equal to zero. Now, if the particle is falling down the plane at a later time, of course, it would be here. This would be a real displacement. But virtual displacement could be along either direction. It could be along this direction or that direction. So, um, but you see, I mean, a virtual displacement must be such that it moves along this line. So, if this is our constraint relation, then we can take a small change of the coordinates and what we get is a very important relation that for a proper virtual displacement, the delta x and delta y, the coordinates or the components of the r vector they must satisfy some relation. They, of course, have to satisfy the constraint relation. So in this example, we actually explicitly calculated that how the delta R will look like. So how, I mean, a typically you would represent delta R for this two dimensional case as delta X I caps plus delta Y G caps. And the relation between delta X and delta Y would be given by the partial of your uh, constraint relation. That is how you define the virtual displacement. Okay. So this is basically a virtual displacement and now we discuss another important concept which is virtual work. Consider a particle which is being subjected to a force F, then a virtual work is defined as the dot product between the force and the virtual displacement. Now here the force means the total force now, that can include the external force as well as the constraint forces. So, I mean, this total force times the virtual displacement is called virtual work. Okay. A particularly useful situation happens. I mean, suppose the particle is static. It's in static equilibrium. Now, a particle would be in static equilibrium only if all the forces which are acting on the particle, they vanish. So, their vector sum gives you zero. So, in other words, a particle would be in a static equilibrium if F is zero, no force acting on the particle, of course, then it will not move. Assuming, I mean, it was static as initial condition. Now, if that happens, then for static equilibrium, particles in static equilibrium, what would be the uh, virtual work? Oh, um, zero, of course. I mean, like uh, if f is zero, f dot delta r is also zero. Now, consider, I mean, not just one particle, consider a set of particles uh, given by the coordinates r1, r2, to rn, n particles. And they are all are at static equilibrium, each one being subjected to a total force fj so jth particle having a total force fj then fj must be zero for jth particle to be in the static equilibrium all right so if that happens then fj dot delta or j which is the virtual displacement of jth particle this dot product um, is zero and then a sum over j does not change anything it remains zero so 
Th th this looks like a trivial relation. All the forces are zero. So what's the big deal? Now, what we do next is we write down the total force in terms of the external force on jth particle and the constraint force acting on the jth particle. And these we substitute in the previous sum. And when we do that, what we get is we get two separate sum. One is the external forces and then delta Rj plus we have the constraint forces times delta Rj. Now you see if uh, this sum vanishes, if this is alone equal to zero, for such type of constraint, I mean such type of constraints, we call them ideal constraints. If that happens, then it is clear that this sum would also be zero. So what we end up with that for ideal constraints, the virtual work done by external forces vanish. So which means that uh, you do not need to know the constraint forces. I mean, uh, this condition alone, the external forces and the virtual displacement, that tells you um, uh, what should be the condition of static equilibrium. We will see some examples later, but now first uh, let us try to understand that uh, what we mean by ideal constraint. I mean, under which condition this can vanish? Well, you remember we looked at Lagrange equations of the first kind, and at least for holonomic constraint, what we did is the force, constraint force on jth particle coming from mth constraint was given by this relation lambda m some constant times the gradient of this constraint the the plane on which the particle is moving its gradient and th that gradient is always perpendicular to the plane so this vector is always perpendicular to delta rj delta rj is our on the plane and this del g m del r j it's perpendicular to the plane i mean that that is how the gradients are so if they are perpendicular then their dot product must vanish so which means i mean this f j is given by this so i mean f j dot delta r j this is zero for all j so if we have a set of holonomic constraints then we can say all, all holonomic constraints are ideal constraints. And for the time being, let us consider only such constraints, all holonomic constraints. So for holonomic constraints, those are ideal constraints. So this particular relation is satisfied. And if that happens, then what we end up with is the principle of virtual work which states that virtual work done by the external forces total virtual work done by external forces vanishes if the system of particle is in static equilibrium it's very important and very useful because uh, suppose you have give you you are given a a series of objects. We have a set of objects and they are not moving. They are in static equilibrium and they also have some constraint. Now you see the big advantage. We do not need to know which way the constraint forces are acting. All we have to do is to create some virtual displacement which agrees with the constraint. Delta RJs must be constructed such that they do not violate the constraint relation. Once you have done that, the dot product of jth virtual displacement and uh, with the external force acting on the jth particle, 
you take that and take the sum over j and that gives you 0. Now this can be used to find out many um, useful relations, the forces uh, acting on some, suppose we know three forces acting on three particles, we have four objects and what would be the external force on the fourth object for a static equilibrium, we can easily calculate that if we know how to construct the delta or j's. So that is the practical utility and we do not need to know the constant forces anymore. Now static equilibrium, it's important undoubtedly, but for our purpose we are more interested in um, dynamics of particles, how particles are moving and that is what we have been doing uh, when we were looking at Lagrange's equation of the first kind. So there what we have is called D'Alembert's principle. Okay. We go back a step, we write down Newton's law for jth particle which is the mass times acceleration of jth particle is equal to the sum of external forces and the constraint forces acting on jth particle. So this is an identity for jth particle and j could be anything for a system of particle. It's true for all particles. Okay. If that happens, then it's automatically true that we can multiply this identity by a proper virtual displacement and it will still be zero. We can take the sum over j and it will still be zero. It's all fine. Now we break the sum apart and collect the acceleration and the external force part and then separately write the component coming from the constraint forces. Now remember we already know that this would be equal to zero for ideal constraints. So which means that uh, we can very simply write mass times acceleration for jth particle subtract from that the external force acting on jth particle and take the dot product of this vector quantity with the virtual displacement of jth particle and the sum over j remains I mean it is zero. Now this is another useful relation. So what did we do actually? I mean if you look at the static equilibrium condition what we had principle of virtual work gave us this condition, remember? And here what we did is we simply added an inertial term and what we got is a prescription for writing down the equation of motion. Well, this actually, uh, you know, this boxed quantity is actually a one way of writing equation of motion provided you know what the virtual displacements are and then you see you do not need constant forces anymore. So this is another handy tool for uh, getting the equation of motion without the knowledge of constraint forces and this is called D'Alembert's principle. So this is D'Alembert's principle. So it was proposed, I think, first by Bernoulli and then D'Alembert uh, showed that, that it is possible to extend the principle of virtual work that applies for static equilibrium to a set of particle which are moving by including an inertial component. So you just have to 
add the mass times acceleration part and you get a similar equation for dynamical particles. So, I mean, it is popularly known as D'Alembert's principle, although, I mean, Bernoulli was associated with its development. Now, we have done considerable bit of uh, theory, the definitions, and we would like to uh, would like to see one example of D'Alembert's principle. We would like to apply to a case where, I mean, which we already know. Remember, we were studying this uh, particle falling down an inclined plane, which had the slope alpha, height h, and the particle's coordinates were x and y. I remember for that we already derived the constraint relation. It was x tan alpha plus y minus h equal to 0. All right. So this is our constraint relation. Then, um, of course, if we take time derivative of this constraint relation, then we get some relation between the acceleration along x and acceleration along y. Moreover, if we take the partial of this relation, then we also get some relation between virtual displacement along x and virtual displacement along y. After all, if the particle has to stay um, on this inclined plane, if it has to move along this line, then delta x and delta y, meaning suppose it's going here. So this is delta x and this is delta y. They must be connected in some way. And this is that, that is what we have written essentially. Now, let us apply D'Alembert's principle. So we have one particle, let's say its mass is m and the gravity is acting downward. So mass times the acceleration, we are writing down all components, both x and y. And then we subtract the external force, which is acting downward. So it would be minus mg j caps. This entire thing will have to be multiplied by the virtual displacement and that would be according to D'Alembert's principle this should be zero. Now here you see we did not write anywhere the constraint forces we do not know what it is I mean it is there somewhere all right so let's proceed with that and here we will substitute uh, the relations that we derived earlier and we will get m x double dot i caps y double dot is minus x double dot so we substitute that and then we have plus mg g caps this entire thing will be multiplied by delta x we take it out i caps and then delta y is minus delta x tan alpha so we have it here now for the simplification mx double dot 1 plus tan square alpha minus mg tan alpha into delta x is equal to 0. It's straightforward, a simple algebra. Now, delta x is arbitrary, so which means its coefficient must vanish, and that gives us the equation of motion. So what we have is x double dot 6 square alpha minus, okay, we take it on the other side, g tan alpha. That's what we have. So we have x double dot is equal to g sin alpha cos alpha. This is exactly same as what we did in the first example we studied. The same problem of course, but at that time we uh, we wrote down the constraint force, we took its component and this is, that is how we calculated the uh, acceleration x and what about the y 
uh, y is straightforward y is minus x double dot tan alpha and that will give you minus g tan alpha time this this so this would be sine square alpha i believe that we already obtained this result although our method was different now here the algebra looks slightly messy but then big advantage is we do not need the constant forces anymore this is particularly useful so uh, this is the advantage of d'alembert principle you do not need constraint forces you just need to know how the constraint looks like but then um, in general i mean how do we apply d'alembert's principle say for example we have n particle system here in this box can we say the coefficient of delta or j vector is zero are they independent of each other? Of course not. They are not independent. Say for example, here even for a single particle you can see the delta x and delta y, they are not independent of each other. So which means in general for a given constant, your delta r j's will not be independent of each other. And then how do you proceed from there? Because you can't make its coefficient vanish. Then it would be a single big expression involving many delta r j's. It's cumbersome. It's absolutely cumbersome. So what we do is we define, we do a coordinate transformation. Instead of delta rj, we define a set of independent coordinates. Of course, we choose less number of coordinates such that, that these coordinates, they agree with the given constraint. Okay. Uh, let's look at a example. Say, look at this uh, inclined plane. Instead of choosing delta x and delta y are i mean x and y the typical cartesian prescription we could have chosen the coordinate along the inclined plane as our independent coordinate i mean uh, it would be a single coordinate and it always agree with the constraint i mean it's moving along this line i mean this uh, this coordinate is chosen along this line so i mean we do not have any problem of constraint forces again because there is no constraint the particle is moving along a line and that's it so you see choosing a set of coordinate which respects the constraint is particularly advantageous and we call it uh, generalized coordinates using generalized coordinates we will show that the equation of motion becomes particularly handy and simple but that would be a part of our next lecture. Thank you.